and then the outside. The disciple is eternal first. Not eternal, internal first. So the cycle changes inside of us, then the outside. That's why you can move and move. We can move to a whole other place and get a whole other set of uh, situations. Furniture, cars, jobs, all that other things. And then still have the same series of problems follow us. I remember one entity that I knew, I won't say the name of it. There was one entity I knew. I'm not going to tell you that it was a business or somebody's personal life. I'm not going to tell you that. But they figured if they changed the name of a particular thing, that it would change the cycle. Well, guess what? They changed the name and they spent a lot of money to change the name, but the cycle stayed the same. Because the problem wasn't in the name, the problem was with the internal parts. And so the internal parts had to be changed. In Joseph's case, the internal parts had to be changed first. He had to go through being uh, forgotten in the jail. He had to go through being lied on by part of his wife. He had to go through being promised something and it didn't come through. He had to go through being raised up high in, 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 in part of his house and then have the rug pulled out from underneath him and lose everything and not have to go back to jail. He had to, he had to go through that so the cycle could be broken so then when God would finally lift him where he needed to be, he would know how to do the handle it the right way. Somebody can say amen. amen. The Bible says that he was the second in command of all of Egypt. The only person he answered to was Pharaoh. And now the one, and Pharaoh said, now go get your people. Because I got some new stuff for you. Let somebody say, I'm ready for my new stuff. Come on, let somebody say, I'm ready for my new stuff. Hallelujah. That might be a new attitude, a new mindset, a new, new leg, a new arm. Some of us got arthritis in the knee. You need a new knee. Amen. Yeah, some of us got pain in the back. You need a new spine. But if I'm ready for my new stuff. Some of us have uh, been working the same job for years after years after years. You ain't got a raise in two years. And it's time for some new stuff to come. Y'all not saying nothing to me. It's time for some new stuff to come to you. Some been in some relationships. And the relationship's been a dead relationship. Ain't no nothing happening. And you need God to prove a, a, prove a fresh wind through there. And give some new life to that thing. And turn it around. And, and, and some new stuff. Give your husband a new mindset. Give your wife a new And when they left with new things, 
And then when they begin to, to dedicate the tabernacle, that they begin to bring offerings to the tabernacle of the new stuff that they had. They brought so much that the man of the Lord had to tell the people, say, that's enough. You brought enough now. That's enough stuff. We got it's more than sufficient. And when God breaks a cycle in your life, the new stuff that comes is more than sufficient to meet every need, to meet every situation, to meet every circumstance, to take care of every problem. Somebody can say amen right there. Amen. amen. When God gives you stuff, it stretches. It meets the need. You know, there's something about a, a, a good old-fashioned cook. They can take a can, one thing a hamburger meat, and some beans and rice, and make it last a week. And make you think every day you're eating a different meal. Over that same hamburger meat, that same pork and beans, and that same rice, and you think you're having something new every day. And they are anointed to stretch something like that, and make it as though it's something brand new every day. Well, God takes the things that we have when cycles are broken, and you may think that you're inadequate or, ins or insignificant, or you don't have the abilities or the talents or the skill sets, and God takes those things, and because He's giving you new stuff, your new stuff expands better than all the old stuff you've ever had. Your new, the, your new mindset, you, you may not have all, you may not have ten pairs of shoes, you've got two pairs of shoes. But God can, because you've got new stuff, you take care of those new shoes and they're shiny and better than the tin pair that you have. You know, because the new stuff, the new attitude and the new mind, the mindset has changed, the cycle is broken, that I don't have enough. The mindset is now, although I got two, this two is better than that tin. Somebody can say amen right there. This two is better than a whole rack of shoes right there. Because the stuff I got meets the need. Amen. Praise the Lord. Amen. Now, let's get to the nitty gritty. How do I break the cycle? Look at somebody and say, how do I break the cycle? Step number one, obedience. Look at somebody and say, step number one, obedience. Turn to Isaiah, the 43rd chapter. Isaiah 38 chapter. This is where we're going to go to work first. This is step number one in breaking the cycle. Step number one in breaking the cycle. Isaiah 38. It says this. Verse 4. Excuse me, verse 1. In those days was Hezekiah sick unto death. And Isaiah the prophet, the son of Amos, came unto him and said unto him, Thus saith the Lord, Set thine eyes, excuse me, set thine house in order, for thou shalt die and not live. That's pretty serious right there. Verse 2 says this, Then Hezekiah turned his face toward the wall and prayed unto the Lord. And say, remember now, O Lord, I beseech thee, how I, how I have walked before thee in truth, and with a perfect heart, and have done that which was good in thy sight. I've been obedient. I've done what you said to do. And Hezekiah kind of wept sore. That means he prayed and laid before God. He lamented. Verse 4. Then came the word of the Lord to Isaiah, saying, Go and say to Hezekiah, Thus saith the Lord. Now here's the prophet. This is the same prophet that told him he was going to die. Now he's coming back with another message. Go and say to Hezekiah, Thus saith the Lord, The God of David, thy father, I have heard thy prayer, I have seen thy tears, and behold, I will add unto thy days fifteen years. And I will deliver thee and this city, and this city out of the hand of the king of Assyria. And I will defend this city. And this shall be a sign unto thee from the Lord that the Lord will do this thing that he hath spoken. Behold, I will bring again the shadow of the decree. Now this is important. This is powerful right here. And behold, I will bring again the shadow of the decrees. Which has gone down in the sun, in the sun, down of Ahaz, ten degrees backwards. 
So the sun returned 10 degrees by which it was gone down. Now the sun rises in the east and it sets in the west. And God said, because you are obedient, you have humbled yourself, you've broken the cycle, the kings previous to you were disobedient, they didn't listen, they were very rebellious, but because you have broken the cycle, I'm going to allow, I'm going to show, not only am I going to defeat the enemy, but I'm going to give you a witness to show you that I'm on your side. I'm going to give you a witness. I'm going to call the sun that rises in the east and sets in the west, I'm going to cause it to, instead of setting in the west, I'm going to cause it to rise in the west and go backwards 10 degrees. Now that goes against the laws of nature. That goes against the laws of physics. That goes against the laws of science. That's not possible because the earth doesn't move. It's the earth, or excuse me, the earth, sun doesn't move. It's the earth that moves. So God literally took the earth on its axis and turned it the opposite direction so the sun would hit it at a different direction, at a different angle. Because this man had become obedient and he put God in remembrance. You know, sometimes we have to, God doesn't forget, but he wants us to put him in remembrance of his word. That's in the scripture, you know. Amen. The Lord, he said, put me in remembrance of my word. Sometimes we got to talk to God and say, well, Lord, you know, I'm faithful and I, 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 I've been serving you. And I understand that some things weren't done right and I made some mistakes. But God, I'm going to weep bitterly and lay before you. And God says, because your obedience, Hezekiah, because your obedience, I, and you, you broke the cycle of idolatry. You broke the cycle of rebellion. You broke the cycle that had plagued the nation. Therefore, I'm going to give you an additional 15 years, and I'm going to reverse the judgment that was put on you. He said, I'm going to reverse the judgment that was put on you. Somebody can say amen. amen. I'm going to reverse. Look at somebody and say, I don't mind God reversing things that have come going against me. Things that have come, I don't mind. Say it with me. I don't mind. I don't mind. God reversing, God reversing things that have gone against me. Judgments have gone against you. Leans have gone against you. Possessions have gone against you. Divorces have gone against you. Separations have gone against you. Losses have gone against you. There's nothing wrong if God says, I want to reverse some of that and give you some new stuff back. Lean, they put a lean on your paycheck. You took 10%, 15%, 20%. But God said, I know how to touch some things. And I'm going to touch the people that put the lean. And I'm going to have them lift that lean off your paycheck. And, and, and the manager, you're going to talk to the manager. And they're going to say, well, I don't know why we're doing this. But we're just going to go ahead and close your account and make your account paid in full. Even though you still owe them $10,000. But God got in somebody. Some of y'all not saying nothing to me today. God got in somebody heart and gave you some new stuff. That new stuff is called uh, influence. And God allowed your influence of anointing on your life to touch that person's life. And because of your obedience, Amen. because of your obedience, look at somebody and say obedience. Amen. Because of your obedience, Amen. because of your obedience, God said, I'm going to allow some stuff to turn around. Amen. You know, I love when God to show signs. Amen. I love when God shows signs. When God shows signs, I love to see God show signs. Because it makes me know that my God, I don't even know it, but it just gives me that extra reassurance that my God is the God. When he does something no man can do, no woman can do, no boyfriend can do, no child can do, no money can do, no friends can do. People say, how did you get in a five-bedroom, four-bedroom, a five-bedroom, three-bedroom house with a two-car garage and you don't have credit but four fifty? Because you say, my God knows how to turn the sun backwards. When you got a new job in a car, zero percent interest rate and you pay 100 percent of the money that you pay on that car goes to the that goes to the premium of that car not no interest rate and people say how in the world did you get that you're supposed to be in special financing that means high interest when they say special financing you're supposed to be in special financing how are you able to do that because my god knows how the sun could go the other way because my god knows how to do the impossible my god knows how to give that's why the Bible says we overcome him by the blood of the Lamb and the word of our testimony. Don't ever stop telling your testimony, baby. Right. Don't ever stop telling people what God did for you. Heard it. Don't ever stop telling how God brought you out of a fire and your literal fire yeah. and brought you out of there and restored you and literally gave you new stuff because yeah. the cycle was broken. Clap your hands and say amen. Our obedience is following the Lord. It's following the Lord as he leads us to the opening of the door of miracles. How many want to see miracles in your life? Yeah. Miracles. 
Miracles still happen. I'm going to say that again. Miracles still happen. I'm going to say it one more time. Miracles still happen. When we obey God, we open the door for miracles. We open the door for the supernatural. We open the door for God to do the miraculous and the thing that, 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 that people say cannot be done all of a sudden becomes done. The thing that people have said that's impossible and it shall never happen. You'll never get ahead. You'll never be married. You're too old. You're too this. You're too that. Who would possibly want you? Well, God knows how to turn some things around where not only will somebody want you, you'll have to pick of the litter who wants you. You won't have to worry about will somebody want me. There'll be more than somebody that wants you. Then it's going to pick the right one. Then that's all you got to do is just pick the right one. Look at somebody say the right one. The right one. Because the cycle is all broken because of obedience. Obedience is something that a lot of adults, we have to learn to do. A lot of us leave home because we don't want to obey nobody. I hit a nerve right there. <laughs> a lot of times we leave home because we don't want to obey. I want to be the king of the castle now. I want to be the queen of the castle now. There are no two kings and no two queens in no castle. Amen. Somebody got to submit to somebody. Amen. Somebody say amen. amen. Obedience is step number one. Step number two is moving on from the past. Look at somebody say move on. Move on. From the past of the breaking of the cycles, Isaiah 43, same book, different chapter. The one got to be obedient. Obedient. The Bible says, Obey them that have to rule over you. I don't answer to no man. Well, if God puts you under a leadership, that's God's delegated authority under him as the over shepherd, and then the pastor is the under shepherd. That means I have to submit to that. I may not like everything, but I have to submit to that because the Bible says they watch for my soul. Somebody can talk to you right here. They watch for my soul. So obedience is good. You know, it's funny. Everybody wants somebody to obey them. But then everybody don't want to obey somebody. Everybody wants somebody. You want them. You want them. You want them. If you got insects in your house, you want them insects to obey you in your house. If you got rodents in your house, you want them rats and rodents to leave your house. You want somebody or something to obey you. Somewhere. You want somebody. You want your kids to obey you. You want somebody to obey, but then we don't always want to obey. Obedience is the first, first key. Number two is moving on from the past. Isaiah chapter 43 and verse 18. Remember not the former things. Neither consider the things of old. Don't even remember the former things. If somebody said, how is that possible not to remember the past? That's a big one right there. How is it possible not to remember the past? How is that possible? The key in, in the Greek, the word forgetting means neglecting. It means neglecting. No longer caring for it, or give over to oblivion. In the Greek, it means neglect. No longer caring for it. Give it over to oblivion. Oblivion is nothing. Nothing. No longer caring for it. Disconnect, remove from it. Joseph never forgot what his brothers did but he disconnected from the anger that was associated with him. He never forgot that his brothers betrayed him because the memory is powerful. The memory is part of the soul area. We remember things. But he, but he disconnected with the emotion of anger and revenge. He chose no longer to feed that and allow the Holy Spirit to water the new stuff that God had put in his life. He made a decision. Everybody said decision. We make decisions whether to let stuff go or hold on to it. Some people hold on to their anger and bitterness because it's the only thing they got. And they know, they feel like if I let go of my anger, if I let go of my bitterness, then I don't have anything. I don't have nothing to hold me. Now we have to understand something. That the Holy Spirit, according to Romans the 8th chapter, goes deep down inside of us. And the Bible says he, he prays through us because we don't know how we ought to pray. But there's something important that he does when he, does, when he, when he prays through us. 
He goes into something, he goes into the recesses of our soul. The recesses are the deep deposits of the soul. All throughout the human body, there are fat deposits all throughout our body. The fat deposits are what cause you to gain weight. The more the fat deposits, the larger you are, the more the weight you gain. When you exercise and diet right, those fat deposits begin to shrink, diminish. They begin to diminish. That's why you have to have exercise and diet together. One, you can't have one without the other. They have to work in concert together. They have to work in concert. And you have to understand the dynamic between building muscle over fat because you look like, well, I'm not gaining, I'm not losing the weight. And you have to understand the dynamic of, of because the, the muscle is, uh, whether the, I believe the muscle is heavier than the fat, I believe it is. And so therefore, it, it causes you to get distorted. And a lot of people, when they have weight loss issues, they get frustrated. And because, well, I've been on the treadmill for, for uh, X amount of hours, and I'm doing treadmill every day, and I'm doing this all these days, five days a week, and I look at the, the scale, and I haven't lost a single pound. They don't understand that while you were on that treadmill, you were building up muscle at the same time. So to, counter out, to counterbalance that, I have to adjust my diet. So I'm not consuming the same amount of carbs and the same amount of calories on the other side. So now when I'm on that same treadmill, I'm forcing my body to tap into those fat deposits and eat that. Are you hearing what I'm saying to you today? Well, the soul works the same way. It works the exact same way. And when the Holy Spirit moves through a person, he goes into the recesses of the soul. And in the recesses of the soul, that's where anger is. That's where unforgiveness is. That's where I don't want to release this is. That's where I can't accept the fact that it just didn't go my way. I cannot accept the fact that I did not get the promotion. I cannot accept the fact that I did not get the house. I cannot accept the fact that I did not get uh, the reward. I cannot accept that's where that resides at, in those deposits. What happened with Joseph, that uh, when he got, Joseph actually had the Holy Spirit. And because he had the Holy Spirit, it was able to go into the recesses of his soul. So when he did see his brothers, the first thing that came to mind was not to kill all of them. Because he had the authority and the power to have every, every one of them executed right there. But the thing that came into his heart was to love them. Not reveal himself, but to love them. How do I let go of the past? By allowing the Holy Spirit into the recesses of your soul. How long does that take? There is no time limit. <clears throat> could take a month, could take 10 months, could take 10 minutes. It's contingent upon the person's heart. It's not contingent upon a time frame. It's contingent upon the person's heart. Now I'm going to show you. I'm going to link this together. How obedience and this works together. If I'm an obedient person, then I understand that the Holy Spirit has to work through me. Because remember, obedience is the first key to cycles being broken. Obedience. So I understand obedience is the first part. That's why the Bible says obedience is better than sacrifice. You can give a $10 million, but if you're not obedient, it won't do you no good. But please give me $10 million. We will gladly take your $10 million. Please. I remember one preacher said, I ain't taking no pimp's money. I ain't taking a drug dealer to come to my church and put $10,000 down. I ain't taking that. And the preacher I was with said, you crazy out your mind? What makes you think that money that the people give it in your, off in your offering? That thing through the same process his money went through. You had drug addicts go to Walmart to buy some soda, buy some food. Drug dealers put that money in the cashier. That cashier went to the men. That money got processed through the system. It's just as dirty as the money in his hand. So what's wrong with you? I said, amen, brother, when he said that. that I said, please, let him walk in my church and put $10,000 on there. And I'm going to take that $10,000 and bless the church. And I know those watching on the video say, ooh, this preacher crazy. I'm just crazy enough to believe God. Yes, I am. God, God bless you any kind of way. Don't have to worry. Well, if God wouldn't use somebody like that to bless you, why wouldn't he? Why wouldn't he use that drug dealer that's on the corner that's got a wad of $10,000 in his hand and you walk by and he don't know why, he don't even know you, but he said, hey man, come over here for a second. He's like, what you want me? Let's go over for a second. Now, I don't know what I'm doing, man, but take this and get out of the way. Get away from me right now. And that $10,000 cash, you like, I can't take this money, this dirty money. You just dropped your blessing right there. God, if God can touch Pharaoh's heart, who was an idolater, who worshipped idol, idols, the Egyptians were idol worshippers. Follow, follow, 
you need to understand the continent of Egypt that was all diabolical, all evil, all worship, all worship idols. They were in idol worship. Just like the pigs and the pagans and the Saxons and all that. They were all in worship, out of worship. That's why God had to have an Abraham. And before Abraham, God had to have his father say, you know, we need to come out of the land of the Chaldeans because they're idol worshippers over here. And God used a Pharaoh who was an idol worshipper to bless his people. God can use whoever and whatever he wants to to bless his people. Amen. Somebody can say amen. amen. So now let me get back on track here. How do I forget by allowing the Holy Spirit to move to the recesses of my soul? Not being obedient. God dealing with you to shut in the church after you get off work. And then every excuse in the book comes up. Well, I'm tired. And then for those of us who are married, your spouse has given you the green light and said, please go to the church and please pray. Please go there and lay out. If she wants you, please get full of the Lord. Would you please go there? Get full of the Lord. Please. Here, let me make you a little lunch and sit in with you. Please go to that church and pray. But obedience. Because obedience will lead to submission. Because you don't submit unless you obey. You hear what I'm saying to you? So the next thing, so how I forget, how am I able to move past? Because the scripture says in 18, remember not the former things, neither consider the things of old. Don't even remember how am I able to do that? Because I'm allowing the Holy Spirit to go into the recesses of my soul area. I'm allowing him to remove. That's why I said don't walk in bitterness. Don't walk in unforgiveness. One of these days I'm going to teach you in a series called The Power of Release. Release is so powerful. That's how Jesus was able to forgive those different people. Everybody that Jesus came in contact to, most of them were sinners. Most of them were ungodly. But he was able to tell them, go and sin no more. The power of release. You can release a blessing. You can release a curse. You can release an anointing. You can release a healing. You can release the power of God. You can release depression. The power of release. Moving from the path. As you move from the path, you have the power to move into a new cycle, to start a new cycle in your life, a new way of doing things, a new outlook. Before, I had a cycle of bitterness, but I choose, like Dave, like Joseph, to disconnect from bitterness. Amen. The patriarch David, when you look at his story, you always look at the fact that Jesse came to the house and lined their mother brothers up and they couldn't anoint them. And then when David came, he anointed him. We always look at the part, the part about what Samuel did. But there's an important segment that we don't really look at. And that's what did David do. David never turned to his brothers and said, look at me. I'm the one. All ten of y'all better than me, but he didn't pick you. He picked me. Now you have to remember what the Bible says. The Bible says that David was a little guy and he was ready. That means he was small stature. He was kind of on the red side a little bit. He was, he was handsome, but he was small. And his brothers were much more muscular men. They were warriors. They fought in the army. So you have to imagine anybody that has siblings, siblings say they, they make fun of each other, they poke at each other, they put each other down. And he wasn't even associated with the group that was in Jesse's house. He was way off over somewhere else. So you have to understand that there was a family dynamic that was going on there. And Joseph, David had an opportunity to say, well, now that I'm the anointed one, you all going to have to bow to me one day. But rather than do that, he disconnected from that. I'm better than you. He chose to break a cycle that had dominated the land of Egypt because the king himself, Saul, was built like that. He was a man of pride and arrogance. He chose to break that cycle and say, you know what? I don't know what God's doing in my life. I don't even know nothing about being a king. That's why it took 20 years before him to take the throne. I don't even know anything about being a king. All I know about is shepherd and sheep. And that's, that's a type of a pastor shepherding the flock of God. Amen. I don't even know anything about any of this. But one thing I do know, when it came time for him to step on the battlefield, he knew he wasn't worthy to wear Saul's armor because he hadn't been tried yet. Because the Holy Spirit was already working through him to break a cycle. And there's a series, there are a series of little things that happen in our life. Little pebbles that happen in our life. And those little pebbles represent little, little chances where the Holy Spirit is saying, I'm trying to show you there's a cycle that needs to be broken. And the first step in breaking it is going to be your obedience. The second step before breaking it is going to be you releasing. 
and not even thinking about the former things. Releasing, not the event, because you can't release the event, you remember the event, but release the anger associated with the event. Release the letdown associated with the event. Now somebody say, how is it possible in my human body? I can't do that. You're absolutely 100% correct. You cannot. I cannot. But through God, we can do all things. Amen. Somebody say amen. amen. I'm no longer interested in carrying on the cycle of, 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 of carrying on the cycle of, that has dominated my life. I'm no, I know how the memory of these things is there. The thoughts of these things is there. I don't forget it. It's there. But everything that's negative that's associated with it, I choose to disconnect from that. My wife has a saying, and she's been saying that since our girls were little. They're all adult women now. All of them. She said that they're young people, but they're adult women. She had a saying, she started telling them when they were little bitty girls. They were little. Kamaya was a big baby baby. And she said, she had she would make them recite it. She said, I'll make a conscious, a conscious, intelligent decision. And she kept saying that for years and years and years and drove that into our girls. Make conscious, intelligent decisions. Because life is about decisions. Life is about decisions. We make more decisions every day than we could ever imagine. Life is about decisions. Some examples of breaking the cycle. Finishing projects. Started school. Finished school. Started building a house in the back. Finished building an addition to the house. Started cleaning out your closet. Finished cleaning out your closet. Started cleaning your house. Finished cleaning your house. Another one is Save money. Look at somebody and say, save money. Save money. Save money. Start off saving money. Now, here's one of the biggest mistakes we all make when it comes to saving money. And why we can't break a cycle. Here's one of the biggest mistakes. You want to know what it is? You want to know what it is? We pick a number too big to start saving with. We say, I'm going to save $100 a month. Or I'm going to save $100 a paycheck. And that number is too big. It's not realistic because of where our life is and the different things that are in our life that we're that the different the, 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 the status of life that we live by. Our commuting expenses, our living expenses. Now there are some areas that we can trim. But it's not realistic because we know how we process and how we think. So we pick a number that's unrealistic and then we're able to keep it up for a month or two, but then we start we, we start feeling like we're deprived of something, so we start tapping back into what we've saved. Rather than pick a much smaller number that's so insignificant that I really don't even notice that it's going to be taken. I don't even really notice, I don't even notice that that amount of money is going to be taken. It could be $10, it could be $20. Do you realize how much money you will save if you just put $20 away of every paycheck? And you set it up to where it's deducted from your account every check. You don't even see it. What I started doing, to give you a little example of what I started doing, because I wanted to break the cycle and save the money, I'm not going to tell you how much I got in my savings. It's not your business. I'm going to say it again. It's not your business. But I got some money. I made a decision that every a certain day of the week that automatically money would be deducted from my checking account into my savings account. Every week. And I picked a very nominal number, $20. I'm not going to tell you how long I'm going to do because some of you are mathematicians. You'll figure out in your mind, this is how much money you got in here. I'm, so I'm not going to tell you how long I've been doing it for. I've been doing it for a long time, you know, i tell you that. I've been doing it for a good while. I don't even feel that $20 being removed. The bank automatically takes it from my checking account to my savings account. I don't even notice it. Now, there was a time where I was one of those people that said, I'm going to save some money. I'm going to save some money. I'm going to save some money. So I would try to do $100 a week, $50 a week, $70 a week. And even when I was working at UPS, making all kinds of money. Big old huge chunk. I'm going to do this, I'm going to do that. And within a month's time, I find myself going back in, tapping into that money. Because the, the, the figure was too large to fit where I lived at, my living expenses at the time. So then what happened? Depression would get on there and the mindset, well, I'm never going to be able to save no money. 
And then I get, then you get a defeatist attitude and be like, what's the use? This ain't going to work. Because every time I try to save something, I always end up going back in there and dipping out of it. If I pick a much smaller number that I don't even realize is being tapped out. I don't even miss it. It's being tapped out. Then I look back six months, seven months, a year later, and I look and I go, whoa. Now you just need to have, by the end, prayer, you got a new mindset, you got new stuff, you don't be like, ooh, I got this, I'm going to go buy me something. You say, no, I'm going to keep building this. Savings. Another one is, kind of talk a little bit about that one, is lose weight. A lot of times when it comes to weight loss, we hit a wall. And we feel we get discouraged because we hit a wall and I can't lose no more weight, I'm not losing no more. And, 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 and we get discouraged and then we give up and we throw the baby out with the bath water say so forget the whole thing. Because I don't see no progress happening here. Well, one thing is sometimes we set an unrealistic number. If I'm 250 pounds and I put a number, well, I'm going to be 180 pounds in six months. And you know that you don't have the discipline yet for that. So I need to lower my expectation to fit my ability at the moment. This is a good teacher right here. I need to lower my time for about a week or two, but then we don't understand how do I live now that the cycle is broken. How do I live? How, what do I do? What do I go from here? How do I maintain this? Does not the Bible say in St. John, the 10th chapter, and the, uh, the 10th verse, I think it's the 10th verse, St. John 10, 10 said, the thief come to rob, kill, steal, and destroy, but I come that you might have life and that more abundantly. Yeah. He comes to steal back. Oh, your cycle is broken, but I'm going to come and steal that victory that broke that cycle. Yeah. I'm going to come and steal that. Okay, you know, you're doing some progress. You know, there's something about when we start to feel better about ourselves, when we start to see ourselves in a new light, then our faith begins to increase and we start to look at things differently because we have a different outlook on ourselves. And we, we don't see ourselves as failures. We don't see ourselves as inadequate. We don't see ourselves as rejected. We see ourselves as loved and we see ourselves as prospered and we see ourselves as blessed and we see ourselves as healed and we see ourselves as desired and we see ourselves as functional and not dysfunctional. When we start to see ourselves that way, our perspectives begin to change on how we look at life. Rather than looking at life through a negative glass or a negative prism, oh, this is the way it's always been and it's never going to change to me. No! The cycles are broken. Now I have to change the way I think and I have to live in that way. Point number three of breaking the cycle. Realize I am complete in Him. And this church hears me say that often. No woman and no man completes nobody. No husband, no wife, no car, no house, no job, no degree, no money, no status completes nobody. Amen. Nothing of this world completes nobody. Well, I can't survive if I don't have this and that. No. You, yes, you can. And yes, you will. Colossians. The second chapter. I remember one time. Hallelujah. Okay. I remember one time I was talking to somebody. And uh, this person had a particular physical attribute. I won't say what it is. Okay. They had a particular physical attribute. And because of this particular attribute, they felt like, well, nobody want them. Or physical, let me see that attribute, characteristic. They had this physical characteristic. And they figured because of this particular characteristic, wouldn't nobody ever want them. I said, really? Yes, you believe that? I said, oh, yeah. I've been that way all my life. I know, I know, I know what nobody want me. And I know, what nobody want this and this and that. I said, really? You believe that, huh? Yeah. I said, well, can I help you? For sure. I started quoting different things to them of people that have that same physical situation. And now I've got biggest quarters and they look, well, I never saw it like that. I said, don't ever let, don't ever, listen to me, because I don't care if you're married or single, don't you ever let nobody tell you don't what nobody wants you. Amen. I don't care if you're married or single, don't you ever let nobody tell you what nobody wants you. I'm the only one that would ever take you. That is a lie from the pit of hell. You are a child of the king. Somebody want what you got. Amen. Amen. That is a lie. 
if God can cause a man that's 100 years old to have his wife die, he's old and wrinkled and broke up, and then cause him to get a new wife and start a whole other family again at 100 years old, I'm sorry, whatever physical situation you or I got, God got somebody out there that wants that. Amen. And somebody tells you, don't nobody, don't nobody want you but me. I'm your, that's called control. That's called control. I've seen that happen before. That's called control, but nobody, nobody wants you. You're too dark. I'm the only one that's gonna love you. I'm the only one that's gonna want to be there for you. I remember one person told somebody they called him an animal because they're dark skinned. They said, "Are you old, blank, 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 blank?" And they called him an animal. Nobody wants you because of this and this and that. I said, "Ooh, that have been me." I said, "You crazy?" Because there's a whole zoo full of things out there that want a whole lot of stuff to look like me. So you, you showed up crazy. I know somebody. I remember the lady that saw the priest and she told her daddy, Apostle Cooper, I'll never forget it. She he said, he said, she said, he, 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 Pastor Spence, he said, Pastor Cooper said, sweetheart, he said, no, no, don't, don't do like that, baby. He said, nobody gonna want that. She said, Papa, somebody want all this. And y'all know how it's hard to be. He said, somebody want this. I don't care if I got one leg, somebody want this. I don't care if I got no teeth and nothing but gum, somebody want this. Don't you let nobody tell you no nobody wants you. Yeah. But me. That is control. That is a lie from hell. I don't care if you're large. I don't care if you're skinny. I don't care if you're dark. I don't care if you're light. I don't care if you got a lot of money. I don't care if you're broke. There are people out there that would want you. In fact, they might be better than the one you got right now. Uh -huh. Amen. They just might be a little bit better. Perhaps you're going to get a divorce. I didn't say that. Don't y'all get crazy and twist my words. Say amen. It's realized I am complete in him. Colossians chapter 2, verse 10 says this. And ye are complete in him, which is the head of all principality and power. That's in your Bible right there. I want you all to read it. We're going to read it together. Turn to Colossians, the second chapter, in verse 10. Because this is going to, oh, this set the devil's mouth right here for those who think I need my wife, my husband, or whatever to be complete. Yes. Read it. Are we all there? Yes. Let's read it together. Verse 10 says, And ye are complete in him, which is the head of all principality and power. That means Sharia, 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 Shabby, Smith, first lady. I love you to death, but I'm not, you're not, I'm not complete because of you. You can say Donna Wayne Smith Jr., I love you to death, but I'm not complete because of you. I, my, your wife, your husband do not complete you. They are an add-on to what God has already done in you. They do not complete you. If that's the case, when they die and God take them, you're going to go to crap. You're going to fall apart. I know what I just said. You're going to fall on the ground and be a bunch of pieces and be a basket case. You are complete in Christ. One of the things that break in the cycle is realizing I am complete in Christ. Man, God, if you don't want to give with me, then that's fine. I love it. But there's a dog. Let it hit you with a big door scripture. I got to go on. I'm not going to let you bind me and hold me and tangle me and bind me up because you want to do this. I am complete in him. I am the head and not the tail. I am strong and victorious. You want to tell me I can't survive without you? Yeah. Watch me do it. In fact, here's a plane ticket. Let me help you go where you need to go. Because I don't need you. If you're not here to help push me, I don't need you in my life. Woo! I'm talking to somebody like that. If you're not there to get behind me and push me, that's why that's good to come here, Sister Smith. Come up here. She called me out. She told her what she did. I also told her what she did. Put your hands on my back. If your wife ain't behind you, push me. Pushing you, you ain't got no wife. Man. <laughs> if your wife is next to you trying to tell me, you need to do this, you need to do that, you need to do this, you got a master. You don't have a wife. Yeah. But if you got a wife, she can tell me, argue me, am I telling the truth right now? Amen. <laughs> Turn this back on. Hallelujah. Turn this on. I want people to hear this. Hallelujah. Is this on? Hallelujah. Is that the truth? It is the truth. Does a woman need to push her man? She absolutely. Can you express that one on that briefly? Uh -huh. <laughs> yes, yeah, it's what she was designed to do. It's what she was created to do. It's to get behind her husband and to push and to pray until he's everything God just predestined for him to be. Right. Now that don't mean, say, now leave me in front of me. Go, start walking. That don't mean take that.
that man and leave him. No, 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 no. That's a bounce. She needs to be behind him, pushing him. Well, he made a mistake. That's all right. You pray. You'll get it right. Well, he failed. That's all right. You pray. He's going to get it together. Well, he don't do it right. That's all right. That's your head.
You know, I, I, I got my own kids and we want to start our own tradition. Yeah, but you always come to my house. I understand that. I've been coming to your house for 30 years. But now, this is year 31. I want to start something new and something different. Well, okay, fine. Just go ahead and go then. But they say it in such a way it throws guilt out there. And that guilt is designed to speak to your conscience. And some people do it knowingly, some people do it unknowingly. And they throw guilt out there and say, well, if you loved us and you loved our family and you loved this and you loved that, then you wouldn't do this. Anybody that puts somebody under the gun like that and puts all the family in there and say, well, if you loved us, then you wouldn't do this. If you loved your family, you wouldn't do this. That person is using that family as a, as a, as a card to bargain with you. Amen. You never use your family as a bargain chip. Amen. If you do this, we'll do that. Never. That's enabling. Let's go teach you today. Amen. Enabling. Immaturity. People that are fully grown and immature. Fully grown and immature. Irresponsible. We're supposed to balance the budget together and make sure we don't overspend and then you go out and go do different things. Well, I thought we needed to do that, but we didn't communicate. We didn't talk. You didn't talk to me about this. Now, this has gone wrong. That's irresponsible. When we're supposed to talk to one another and get a balance and make sure we got everything lined up. And then if we have the resources, then we go and do that. Well, I wanted it. It was a good sale. And I didn't think it was going to come around again. So I just decided to do it. And you just need to love me. And this is the way I am. And you have you be married me. And this is the way I am. You need to know. And then he breaks down. And he says, okay, all right. I'll just work some overtime to compensate for this. But then she does it again. Or he does it again. You got some men that's irresponsible with money. Some men, you got some men that are worse with money than women. Typically, women are usually better with money than men are. Usually, women are better budgeters than men are in most cases. Usually, men are more impulsive. Usually, they're more impulsive and they'll operate off their impulses. Women usually take a step back and process things a little bit deeper before they make a decision. Usually, usually. I'm putting all kind of asterisks by that. Usually, 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 usually. Usually. But that third part of breaking the cycle is key. Realizing I am complete in Him. And because I don't realize, I'm, until I realize I am complete in Him, I will be an enabler. I can be married two, three, four times. I can have two or three best friends. I can have job after job and resource after resource until I understand not in my head, but in my heart. Well, how do you know the difference? Because when it's in my heart, I'm absolutely obedient to what God says. I'm like the Bible says, David, even though David sinned with Bathsheba, in Acts, the, I believe it's the 5th chapter, the 13th chapter, the Bible says, David, my servant, did all my will. He didn't disobey God when he went and got Bathsheba. He didn't disobey God when he did that. He disobeyed God by not being out there with the kings fighting the war. That's where he disobeyed God. Because he wasn't out there leading his armies in battle. That's where he disobeyed God. He didn't disobey God. I know I'm going against your theology and y'all getting all upset and mad, but just pray the Lord speak to you. He did not disobey God with Bathsheba. He had to pay a price, but he disobeyed because he wasn't where he was supposed to be. Obedience. The first part. The second part. Realizing or moving on. Forgetting. Not choosing to hold on to the pain associated with something. You remember the event, but you choose to let go of the pain associated with it. Number three, I am complete in him. When I realize I'm complete in him, I'm no longer an enabler. I'm no longer someone that patronizes somebody that's irresponsible or an underachiever. I told you before, I think I said it on a Thursday night. You all wasn't here, most of you. When I first got married, I couldn't read very well. I'm still not the best reader, but I can hold my own. When I first got married, Sister Smith and I were living in the Tenderloin, way before we had children. She used to have me read the Bible to her when I get home from work, and I worked the graveyard shift and swing yard, swing shift, swing shift back then. 
And I would get home and she'd make this pot of spaghetti, a big old huge plate of spaghetti, these homemade biscuits, haven't seen them in decades. Can't, 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 not gonna make biscuits, please. But she said, we're gonna read the Bible. And then sometimes at night before we go to bed, she said, I want you to read to me. I graduated high school, public high school system, but I was deficient in reading. And she worked with me to help develop that in the early years of our marriage. Because how are you going to preach the gospel if you can't even read the Bible? That wasn't her mindset, but that's, that's just a fact. How are you going to read the Bible and preach the Bible to people if you can't even read that book yourself? You've got to read that book. And she took it apart herself, and I was obedient and was a student, and she helped me get past that. She, when she chose not to be an enabler, and make excuses for me not being able to read. Because that not only affected that reading the Bible when I would go to work, I would have to read reports. When I got my first driving job working for United Couriers, making $5.25 an hour, I had to read a delivery sheet. I had to be able to read a map. And if she had not invested that in me and chose not to be an enabler, to break the cycle in my life. Because when I was a little kid, they would tell me, just when I was real little in elementary school, they said, well, if you don't know the word, just go and pass the next word to you until you get to the next one that you know. And I developed that cycle in my mindset all the way up through high school. So if I came across a word that I couldn't pronounce, I didn't know what it mean, I'd just skip the word and go to the next one. And just do it again and just do it again. So by the time I, when I become an adult, now I'm dysfunctional. I have a cycle. But somebody took the interest in me to say, I'm going to help you with this. And that one move helped launch a career. To win the conclusion of the career, I've mean, heard my testimony of what we're doing at UPS and all that. But if it hadn't started then, I would have never made it to UPS at the end. Never. She chose not to be an enabler. Too many people keep the cycles going in lives because we enable. We're codependent. Codependency is the, is the heading, but underneath it is all these different areas that are connected to me. I have to finish. All these different areas that are connected to me. In one of the series, it's like one of the, in the life series, you all remember we were talking about Relationships, and we broke down in Acts, the fifth chapter, how when Ananias and Sapphira went before Peter, and the husband went first, I believe, and he lied, and he dropped dead, and then Ananias and Sapphira comes in behind him, and she does see she continues the same lie, and Peter says, "Why are you doing this?" In modern in modern terms. Why are you enabling your husband? Why are you participating in this lie? You don't have to do this. Why couldn't you just say, he's wrong, he wants to do that, but I know he actually sold it for this much. She would have found grace, but she didn't do that. She continued to be codependent and lied and she dropped dead to Because if you have a lie to me, you lie to the Holy Spirit. That third part of breaking the cycle, of realizing that we are complete in Him, is very key because that's when we understand that a lot of the things that I've attached myself to in my relationships and my experiences that I hold near and dear, a lot of those things are dysfunctional themselves. And if I, if, I, if I stay connected to that, or I don't speak against it, or pull myself away, you say, well, how can a husband and wife pull themselves away? The Bible says the two are one, they're one flesh. It's simple. Because you're my wife and my husband, I don't have to agree with everything you say. I don't have to endorse you. If you're, especially if you're wrong, I don't have to endorse you. I say, no, you're wrong. I've spent too many, I've been in this thing too long. I've had too many husbands, too many wives, a couple churches, and who's your husband? Just pray for it. We just pray for him. Just pray for him. I mean, I used to tell that to the pastor all the time before my time. Just pray for him. And then you come to find out she's covering up for a deficiency. 
And by her covering up, she's becoming an enabler to that deficiency. Well, husband do the same thing. That's my wife. I don't expose my wife. I'm sorry, you're not a covering if you're covering wrong. A covering is a healthy thing. It brings health. It doesn't facilitate brokenness or sickness or ailment. I'm talking emotionally now. A covering speaks life. There's been times when my mom was married, my sister's fifth. You yeah, know, Pastor, you know, he, he off right now. Don't need to go praying. He, did, he need to get it right. He need to do this. He need to do that. And there's been times when the, other, when the shoe was on the other foot. No, no, he need to do no, the things there. That's a healthy relationship. Nobody's patronizing nobody. Nobody's covering for other persons. In, well, I think you're supposed to cover your spouse no matter what it is. You're going to cover right into hell. That's what you need. Amen. Because they can't get help and deliverance until you expose it so the Lord can bring in the healing now. Why do you think Sarah didn't drop, not, drop dead when she lied to God? She said, I didn't laugh. And God said, oh, yes, you did. But God didn't kill her because of Abraham. A covering, a real covering, understands that we have a cycle that's in this relationship, and this cycle is not healthy. We're not progressing, we're going backwards, or we're stagnant now. People have said, you don't have a problem with your wife going on trips and traveling across the country and across the world? You don't have a problem with going to England for three weeks? Not a problem at all. Even though I don't want to go to England, that's all in my trip. I've had brothers actually tell me, say, you don't worry about that? I said, what do I got to worry about? But, 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 you know, this is Number one, I trust her. Amen. Number two, no, actually, number one, I'm a good guy. Amen. So God's got me. Number two, I trust her. Amen. Number three, she ain't no fool. She loves the Lord. So what do I got to worry about? I'm just saying, I couldn't do all that. And then maybe you find a way to the altar. Yeah. Maybe you smother your wife. Right. Because I've seen that so many times. Baby, you smothering your wife. She can't even go to the grocery store. Where you going? When you going to be back? Sister Smith and I go and come. Like, where you at? What you doing? Where you at? Where you going? How long you going to be there? That woman 48 years old. I don't need to know her every little step where she going. She can be gone all day. I don't need to know where she's at. Who you been with? Where you stopped at? What you been doing over there? Where you going? To? What? That's a grown woman. I didn't marry a child, I married a grown woman. Amen. Amen. She didn't marry a child, she married a man. Amen. Oh, we don't need to give account to each other. Well, I don't, you need to be accountable to each other. We are accountable to each other, but we're also mature and we realize we're complete in Him. Amen. I know her relationship with God is far stronger than her relationship with me ever will be. Somebody can say amen. amen. Those are your three steps. I have to stop here. I have to stop here. I'm not even going to pray for you today. I'm not even going to pray for you today. The Holy Spirit told me that 30 minutes ago, but now I'm telling you publicly. I'm not even going to pray for you today. I'm not going to pray for you because of anger or frustration. No, 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 no. I'm not going to pray for you because this needs to sink in. Amen. You need to chew on this and eat this all week long. Some of us that are in relationships need to have some serious talks with our spouses. Some of us that have best friends in relationships, we need to have some serious talks this week. And you said, what did the Bible say? What did the word say? What did the scripture say? You've been my best friend for 20 years, but this cycle of our relationship, look who we are. We've been best friends for 20 years, and we still both do the same thing. We haven't progressed. We haven't moved on. We're still here. Yeah, I got a new house. You got a new house. But our minds were still in the same.